It was August 26th and the temperature was 108 degrees when I went and dropped my partner off at soccer and had some work I needed to get done. So I walked into Starbucks and was really confused to see the fall seasonal drinks were available. <laughs> and that's when I knew I had to make this video. Let me start by saying I am a fall girly. I spend the months of June through August wishing to see the highs in just double digits here in Texas, wishing for fall to come. I've made a couple pilgrimages to the Northeast because I love actual fall. I love the temperatures, I love the coziness, I love the seasonal eating of it all. But obviously those idyllic versions of fall are not available to everyone depending on where you live. But someone somewhere decided, well, if people all over the place are yearning for fall, let's give it to them. Or rather, let's sell it to them. In September, you're a fall girl, and then October, a Halloween girl. November, you're a Christmas girl, with the exception of one day, Thanksgiving, where you become a fall girl again, and then December, you're a Christmas girl. I do wanna give a quick shout out to Tiffany Ferg, one of my favorite YouTubers, who made a similar video to this last year, so I'll link it below if you wanna go check it out. But I'm going to be taking the topics that she covered just a little bit further and in my own Shelby environmentalist, eco-minimalist kind of style. To get some of the basics out of the way that I feel are definitely important to this story, um, the first day of fall is September 23rd. And that's not just a date like made up by some, I mean, I guess we te technically kind of picked the exact date, but that is typically something that's following the seasons of the earth. The way the earth tilts on its axis, the way the weather patterns are, the way the sun hits the earth, that's how we decide what seasons really are. That's, that's what seasons that's where they that's where they came from okay fall decor hit the shelves this year as early as the beginning of August maybe even late July now if you're surprised that the first day of fall isn't until September 23rd imagine how surprised I was to learn that the first day of winter isn't until December 21st and I can't help but feel that the season of fall was artificially made earlier and earlier within the year maybe to make room for the even bigger consumerism season that is the holidays to give it more time to uh, capitalize on itself. And at this point, if you're thinking, how, Shelby, could the commodification of fall harm the planet? Well, there's a lot of ways, which we're gonna talk about, but one of the biggest ways that I really wanna drive home and what I focus on on this channel, and the thing I'm most passionate about, actually, like, in the world, is because the relatively new obsession with fall is fueling mass amounts of consumerism, and consumerism is kind of the basis of all of our environmental problems. If those links don't make sense, how consumerism and the health of our planet are linked, you probably haven't seen one of my videos before, and that means you probably should hit subscribe, because I've got a lot to talk about. But let me make my spiel really short this time. Essentially, a lot of people think of sustainability and like environmental activism. A lot of times we're talking about the end of a product's life cycle, right? We're talking about waste that ends up in our landfills, in our oceans, and all those sort of things. But my passion is really in the environmental impact that comes before you click buy now, or before you buy anything at home goods this season. The environmental impact of the things we buy, the majority of it happens before we get it, and that is by extracting things from our planet and clear cutting forests and mining and destroying people's communities, taking advantage of our Earth's natural resources at unsustainable levels, as in literally we cannot sustain the amount of resources we are extracting from our planet long term because the Earth cannot replace those resources as quickly as we are consuming them. And there's a lot of environmental impact associated with just resource extraction in and of itself impacts on our water our soil our air our people but we'll move on to the next part of the phase which is shipping those raw materials all over the world to have them refined and mined and manufactured into a usable product so think about extracting metals from the ground and then shipping them somewhere to be heated to ungodly temperatures to make them into the building blocks that then are shipped somewhere else to be made into the parts and then those parts are shipped somewhere else to be made into a product and then that product is shipped somewhere else to a distribution center where you can either buy it for shipping or maybe you can purchase it off of a shelf. And think about all the emissions associated with all parts of that process. All of that happens before it makes it to you. So really the end of a product's life cycle, yeah, it matters, but not as much as not buying so much shit because all doing all of that is literally what leads to climate change, 
ocean pollution, lack of resources, droughts, deforestation, all of the environmental problems you've heard about are sourced from consumerism and a lot of times consumerism of goods that people don't need and really probably at the end of the day don't even want. I guess I really did make my spiel super fast this time and that's fine because I really want people to understand the link between the things that we buy that companies irresponsibly produce and all the environmental crises that we're facing. And I focus a lot of my videos on that intersection, but specific parts of consumerism. So recently I made a video all about Timu. If you want to go check that out. We have to acknowledge why Timu is so cheap. We have to talk about why that's not always a good thing. We have to talk about why these things exist. If you're going to make a fucking video talking about all the things that are so cheap, say why. And if you're not going to, you're now I really wanted to ask all my friends that were at my house this weekend when I say fall what is the first thing that comes to your mind just to prove my point that it's going to be this one thing but I would love for you to let me know in the comments when I say fall what pops into your mind I think for a lot of people it's going to be pumpkins at least for people in the US pumpkins are the biggest thing about the fall season here and to be more specific for the commodification of it all pumpkin spice where the fuck did it come from? So pumpkins were and still kind of are a staple food of what is now known as the US or more specifically North America. The native people of the US relied on pumpkins because they were a really reliable source of food. They grew like a weed, at least that's what the native people said. That has not been my experience in my attempts to be a pumpkin farmer. I have lost, I don't think I've ever actually grown a pump. Nope. nope, scratch that, reverse it. Once I had a very, very small squash. But other than that, I've lost all of my pumpkins to either too cold temperatures or too hot temperatures. So I am glad that it was a native food that was able to grow easily for them to sustain life. I just, if it were up to me, when I had to grow all the pumpkins, we would be fucked. But once colonizers came to the US and kind of took over the land, they started farming pumpkins and realized that they were a seasonal thing because crops require certain environmental conditions to grow, right? Different temperatures, different water needs, where the amount of sun that they're getting from the sky changes throughout the season. So pumpkins are a seasonal food by nature. So from what I read, certain foods would no longer be thriving, things like cabbage, they would no longer be growing in the fall season, and then pumpkins would be the kind of like last resort food is how I've heard it described. Like they preferred the fruits that grew in spring and summer, but then we turned to fall and eh, I guess we'll start eating pumpkins. So they were a food source for native people and then the colonizers grew them as a crop in seasons, but then fast forward to the industrial revolution and a lot fewer people were living and working on farms. The connection to what grows and what season kind of fizzled out, but the pumpkin remained an iconic part of American or US culture. And more specifically, the pumpkin was still an icon for the cozy season of fall. And also worked its way into the tradition of Thanksgiving, which anytime we bring up Thanksgiving, we have to acknowledge what a problematic and whitewashed holiday it has become. But the way pumpkins work their way into Thanksgiving is through the iconic pumpkin pie. But the reason for its popularity was definitely not for how it tastes, but more what it represented to our culture. And you can really see that today if you think about how often you see pumpkins and how little it's actually associated with food. Like even a lot of the things that you get that are pumpkin spice today have no pumpkin in them. But the first time we actually see the term term pumpkin spice uh, being coined is actually by McCormick in 1950 when they bottled the spices that actually go into making a pumpkin pie. So once the spice was bottled and being sold as pumpkin spice by McCormick's in the 1950s, it became easy to throw it into anything. But it seems that it really didn't catch as being thrown into everything until around the 1990s. So technically and really not surprisingly, Starbucks did not invent pumpkin spice, nor were they the first to do it because the pumpkin spice latte wasn't put on the menu until 2003. But they are surely the ones who have popularized it for it to become what it is today. Now I'm giving you all this background because I don't know if you feel the same way about marketing as I do. But understanding the background of how pumpkin spice came to be and then how it has transformed is really interesting to me because I think a lot of it is not just through natural culture, but a lot of it has been influenced by marketing and by capitalism. And I personally see a lot of marketing as manipulative. I think that just because a brand has the money to be able to make us think or feel or buy and then thereby change our culture in a certain way, I I don't see that as really an okay thing. I don't, I don't like it, it feels icky. So if we think back to life before the industrial revolution, what's really interesting is a lot of the spices that are in pumpkin spice were actually used to, uh, what is the word? Like 
keep meat, what is that word? Preserve. These spices were often used in preserving food for the upcoming fall and winter because those months are not as productive for food as spring and summer. So if you really think about smells and how that sort of becomes ingrained in our culture and passed down, those smells are associated with a cozy season, with a happy memory of just people around the home, preparing for the upcoming season, working together as a community, enjoying the change of the seasons and going into a more cozy time. And to further create that link from a very young age is the experience of essentially cosplaying life before the industrial revolution of being on a farm by going to a pumpkin patch. And so it starts from a really young age of you having fond memories going to things like pumpkin patches and creating those like neural pathways that pumpkins are associated with happy times from when you're so young. And since those connections have been passed down for hundreds of years, we have a sort of cultural as well as individual nostalgia around these things. And marketing loves to exploit nostalgia. Nostalgia marketing as well as FOMO and scarcity marketing. There's a lot of that going on. So let me just define nostalgia marketing for you. Nostalgia marketing can be defined as a marketing strategy that leverages past trends, symbols, events, or fads to evoke positive emotions from a target audience. By appealing to people's sense of nostalgia, marketers aim to create an emotional connection between the consumer and the product or service being offered. This emotional resonance can make the product more appealing and can drive consumers engagement, brand loyalty, and ultimately sales. And let me tell you, they're not quiet about it either because as I was researching this video, I was trying to see if anybody else had takes on this specifically and how nostalgia marketing is linked to like hyper consumerism and how that connects to sustainability and all of that. I didn't find that specifically, but what I found while trying to research nostalgia marketing is that brands and marketing agencies are just out there saying, yeah, we're doing this. We are preying on your evolutionary need to connect to positive and happy times to make you buy things. I saw a lot of that, specifically this Forbes article titled, Why Nostalgia Marketing Works So Well With Millennials and How Your Brand Can Benefit. So as a millennial, I thought this was even more interesting because we are the target audience. And I found that to be super interesting that several of these brands and marketing like agencies that I found were calling that out. And I wanna read you this bit from the Forbes article because it, it, I think it's very telling and I think it will make this more, more tangible and make a connection for you. So it says, why are nostalgic centric campaigns resonating with the millennial audience? Reliving positive memories and beloved icons from past feel goods. Alongside hectic work schedules, unrelenting responsibilities, and more, fond memories make us smile and leave us open to brand messaging. Which is so interesting, essentially saying that the state of the world that millennials have had to deal with since we've <laughs> become adults is so frantic and hectic that we are desperate to connect to simpler times. And brands are literally using the fact that they are destroying our economy and our quality of living to then sell us shit. On top of things like a global pandemic, of course, what they're describing here is when things are hectic and scary, we want to latch on to nostalgia of simpler times when we were younger and life was much easier. And I really noticed this uptick in something as simple as brand logos. I noticed that brands like Pizza Hut and Burger King, those are the only ones that I know their, their logo has changed like visibly. I've been like, why do brands keep doing this? It's nostalgia marketing. It's interesting to reflect on a trend that's been popular in branding for the past few years, that the return of a retro logo designs of the 60s and 70s by going back to previous designs, brands can reconnect with previous customers and establish connections with a whole new generation. Oh, and another great example is when McDonald's brought back its characters from when we were little kids. Like, the, I think it's Grimace. I was never that much into McDonald's as a kid, so I don't really know all of that, but I know a lot of kids were. I know the Happy Meals were a big deal, Grimace, and apparently the Hamburger. Burglar. They're using them on billboards and to bring back shakes. Literally, that is a great example of nostalgia marketing. And I think all of this is so much further amplified because of FOMO and social media. Essentially, you want all the good vibes that come along with fall and you don't want to miss out because it's only available for a certain time. This is going to prey on all three of those types of marketing that we talked about, nostalgia, FOMO, and scarcity marketing. So I thought it would be fascinating to really explore exactly how FOMO impacts 
impacts our brains and why these sort of tactics are problematic in my opinion because it's not as simple as just have a little self-control as this comment actually suggested. Hyper consumerism is a result of no self-control, not the result of advertisers or influencers. We need to take responsibility for our behavior and stop passing blame on others. That right there is why I want to make this whole video but specifically this part where I talk about FOMO and how marketing literally preys on our brains that have evolved over many many uh, years. How they are using the things that we don't exactly have control over to exploit. And like yes we could take more steps to have more self control when we talk about these sort of things just because brands are preying on our weak spots and as we're going to discuss things in our brains that have come from evolution doesn't mean we have no control over it. Like I completely agree with that but at the same time why would we? Like literally if people are not talking more about how consumerism is actually the root of most of the environmental crises we see why would anyone care? Why would anyone not buy any little thing they wanted? This comment is essentially assuming that someone that everybody out there is shopping knowing that this is the the thing on a massive scale that leads to destroying our planet but the reality is a lot of people don't have that connection as a matter of fact me I've told this story a lot of times so if you've seen it give this video a thumbs up no but I have told this story so many times how I went into college as an environmental science major I thought I was an environmentalist and, and at the core I was but I wasn't living with my values because I won best dress in high school because I never repeated an outfit and yes that was all by buying fast fashion with the allowance I was given. I still don't really understand how I did that. But at the time, if you asked me if I was an environmentalist, I fully would have said yes. But I was fully dripped out in fast fashion and never even repeating an outfit with those fast fashion pieces until I went to my first environmental science class and I will never forget it. And I learned about the story of stuff and the impact that the stuff that we buy has on the planet. But how are other people going to be making that connections unless other people are talking about it like this? So this comment felt a little silly to me. So let's do a quick deep dive into how FOMO impacts our brains and how it leads us to buy things from influencers on social media, from our friends, and especially from marketing when they use it. I compiled some really interesting things. Let me read them off for you. Okay, so first of all, release of stress hormones. When you perceive that you're missing out on something, your brain may release stress hormones like cortisol. This can induce a state of unease or anxiety, urging you to take action. That is quite literally what FOMO is. So it's not quite as simple as self-control. Activation of social reward centers. I remember this from the one psychology class I've taken. The idea of being included in an experience or social setting activates the brain's reward system, specifically areas like the vernal stratum, which is associated with pleasure and reward. Missing out on these rewards can be perceived by the brain as form of loss. Comparison mechanisms. The brain naturally engages in social comparison. When we see others experiencing something we're not, areas involved in self-evaluation and decision-making, like the pre prefrontal cortex are activated, often leading to a feeling that we're falling short. So that's a little bit about how FOMO impacts our human brains in this moment, but I want to also talk about how FOMO is literally evolutionary. In early human history, being a part of a group was crucial for survival, offering protection and shared resources. Missing out on information or group activities could mean a disadvantage in these crucial aspects. Hence, FOMO could be seen as a modern manifestation of an ancient survival instinct to belong and stay informed. I think that kind of ties together really nicely that it's not all about self-control but here are a few other ways that evolutionary it makes sense that FOMO impacts us on a human level people want to feel like they are a part of something and it's not always in your face and super conscious but a lot of that stuff happens back here but sometimes out loud maybe it is fall I'm also not even like a pumpkin spice girl <laughs> like I'm not but Today is the day that all the fall drinks came out of Starbucks. So I think I'm gonna go over there and get all of them. It feels like something that I should do. You know, like society has got a real grip on the PSL and I just, I wanna feel a part of it. I wanna be included. Editing me here at my sister's house. This is obviously not my house. But watching this back and editing, uh, I kind of had a realization that I really wanted to put in here, which is that individualism has been so pushed and normalized and kind of held up as the pinnacle, right? If you start thinking about suburbs and nuclear families and like people in the household working all the time, like hustle culture, all of this, all of that really falls under this umbrella of individualism and really creating communities 
of people who are not connected at all. Like it's pretty normal in today's society to not know or really even talk to your neighbors. And especially if they don't live like the literal next door over, you just don't know them. You're not connected to them. But that is very much not human nature. Like we are social animals. We are meant to talk and know and feel connected by knowing people relating in that way and then trying to fit in those communities. Um, like that's just normal human nature. And I think because we become so individualistic, so disconnected from our actual communities, that the way we're trying to then fill those gaps and make those connections is through consumerism. And I think that that is something that was kind of purposefully done through capitalism and American propaganda to be specific. And so instead we are filling it through what we see on social media and filling the trope of things like the Christian girl Autumn or the typical fall girl in order to fit into that community. You have to look a certain way, dress a certain way, decorate your house a certain way. The thing that makes you a part of that community is what you buy through consumerism. And I also just started thinking about how many things in my life have changed since I've become more community focused. But I can make that a whole separate video if you want but I really wanted to put this point in here. But here's the thing, I'm not really bothered by people who want to try a, a fall drink, to switch their drink up to kind of correlate with the season. I think that's kind of cute. I do hope that instead of supporting Starbucks, you would support like a small fair trade coffee shop, but that's not what I'm here to make a big fuss about. The problem I think is that once pumpkin spice became a thing and once fall became such a strong staple used for marketing, things got a little out of hand. For instance, fashion and social media. Now, fall outfits have always felt like timeless staple pieces to me. And like chunky sweaters are my favorite thing ever, even though that doesn't make any sense because I live in Texas and it is indeed still 100 degrees outside. Uh, in the beginning of September. And we'll probably maintain triple digit highs until the end of the month. And even though I feel like a lot of people relate fall with the same type of vibe, it's like sweaters and warm colors and, and those sort of things, which are not really trends. They, they come around every year. And I think we've gotten a little bit confused about nostalgia that we think we need to buy new sweaters every year to feel connected to the nostalgia that we associate with fall. When in reality, the real nostalgia would be if you had the same sweater and you used it every fall season. That would be a more meaningful way to connect with nostalgia that people I do think are reaching for when they want to fill their closet with new sweaters. I felt the need to point this out specifically because this video came across my For You page. Life hack, fall is right around the corner. Start buying your fall sweaters now. Last summer, right before fall, I got this sweater in nude and it was like the perfect Rory Gilmore sweater. Everyone was asking me where it's from, but it was already sold out because it was fall and everyone saw it already. So if you want a cute little Rory Gilmore sweater, I suggest getting it now. And in response, I just want to start a literal movement where everyone takes their fall sweaters or their winter sweaters or whatever seasons that you experience and put them away for part of the year when you're not wearing them so that you don't see them and you kind of forget about them. And then when you pull them back out in fall, the actual nostalgia comes rushing back to you and you don't feel the need to go and buy a bunch of new sweaters every year. When you start feeling the fall marketing come on from now on, pull that box out get that dopamine hit and avoid buying new shit every year. It's absolutely mind blowing that people say things like this online and then people also enjoy that. I don't know. It's so bizarre to me because that's not my way of being like involved with the world now. I'm, I'm not connected to trends and fast fashion in that way. But the way that people have so many likes and comments on social media being like, oh my God, so you're so smart for this is shocking to me. Hence me making this video to hopefully talk to a few more people who I can change their mindset around this. So the drinks and food of it all are kind of whatever to me. Have a little bit of fun, replace your coffee with a pumpkin coffee. Okay, little harm done there. Like I said, hopefully you're supporting a small business and not one that's like kind of taking over small businesses like Starbucks. But that's one thing. The fashion of it all, fast fashion has huge environmental impacts. There are so many ways you can learn about that. I think I've said my piece with that. But let me share with you some of the most mind blowing products that have come out just because of the nostalgia, the FOMO, the seasonality of it all. Toilet paper. Pumpkin spice scented toilet paper. Things are getting out of hand. Spam. Yes, yes, Spam had a pumpkin spice flavored. Can't. Let me know if anybody has tried that. Let me know in the comments if you tried that. I've never had Spam in my life. Pumpkin spice flavored 
kind of anything other than a baked good to me sounds disgusting. So meat, if that's even what you call spam, I'm not really sure. I'm, again, I've never had it. I don't know what's in it. I know it's cultural for some people. Go for it. But the pumpkin spice flavor in it, no, oh, thank you. Trash bags, <laughs> fall uh, pumpkin spice scented trash bags. Caviar, caviar seems like an even more ridiculous one. Again, never had caviar. Let me know if you have. And this one really blew my mind. Pumpkin spice flavored whipped cream, wait for it, for dogs. Okay, we're not even stopping at pumpkin spice flavored whipped cream. This is for our dogs. I just find the overall need to put pumpkin spice in everything and capitalize on all of the different types of marketing that we've talked about today. I find it to be really disturbing, to be honest, but these were kind of funny to laugh about. So there's your lighthearted moment. Now I wanted to break all of that down because I have a really big problem with consumerism kind of like taking over the marketing. I have issues with the consumerism of it all. But what I found interesting and in a very big way, probably problematic is that people now associate fall with the things that we've talked about today. The way that you can just kind of artificially create a fall scenario is is really concerning in a way that I don't even really know how to express to you. So the fact that people think that when fall decor hits the shelves, oh, fall is coming. When Starbucks put out their, their pumpkin drinks, oh, fall is here. When we start talking about, oh, I really just wanna wear a sweater, but the weather outside won't let me because fall is here, but it's not. Right? Basically what we're seeing is people wanting to emulate what fall is while not associating it with the actual season of fall. Like we talked about in the beginning, fall is a literal season, a function of our planet, of our weather systems, of the amount of light we're getting in a day, of the temperatures, of the Earth's natural cycles. But we're so disconnected from it. And what scares me the most about the consumerism and the marketing of it all is we are really, really, really separating ourselves at this point from actual seasons and therefore from nature, from the environment. And I just, I can't even say in words how much that, I, I think the word is scares me. By offering these things earlier and earlier, by putting out the fall decor sooner, by Starbucks releasing their drinks in August, by moving these things up and up and up, people are decorating their apartments already. I'm seeing it on my For You page, on my Instagram pages. By doing all of that, we kind of forget that there is a reason that fall is a season. We kind of forget that the reason that pumpkins don't exist everywhere in August is because they need specific conditions to grow and those conditions are in fall. And by humans kind of engineering this season for capitalism, we think that we can just move it and place it wherever we want. And in reality, if we understand our connection to the planet, that is not true. And my worry is always that the weaker our relationship is with our planet, the place that we call home and depend on for life, the weaker our connection is to nature in that way, the less likely we are to advocate for it. And not just to have nice places to go hiking or to have nature. I don't just mean to preserve of pretty places just for our enjoyment. I mean like literally we cannot sustain the level that we are extracting from our earth the way that we are right now. And the, the further we become disconnected from that fact, less likely they are to advocate for a planet that we can sustain life on. Or to take it even further, and maybe even worse, for people to think that fall just keeps coming around no problem willy nilly, the products keep showing up, Starbucks drinks keep coming out, they might not even realize that we are already experiencing Experiencing a lot of issues with the seasons. For instance, Texas this year saw one of the worst heat waves we have ever had in history, a pretty serious drought. And without us manipulating things through capitalism, we wouldn't be able to grow pumpkins in the same way this year as we would in the past. But because we are able to ignore the seasons through our disconnect from nature and grow it in an artificial way, people are are less likely to make the connections of climate change is impacting our weather patterns, which is impacting our ability to be able to grow these foods that I look forward to all year. That connection becomes weaker and weaker as the products keep showing up on the shelves despite things like record-breaking heat waves and droughts, both things which would impact the productivity of these crops. If we continue to see fall as products and we forget about the fact that fall is an actual season, we might miss the fact that the leaves are not changing in the same way that we've 
we've known them to be for hundreds of years. Their colors are becoming less brilliant. Those transitional seasons, which fall is, are becoming shorter. The change is coming later in the year because our seasons are wobbling. And if we continue to see marketers be able to prey on our brain functions to connect fall with consumerism, we might miss out on the way that our behavior is impacting the things that actually make fall what it is. From 2014 to 2021, the Northern Hemisphere experienced the eight hottest Octobers on record, and the Northeast, which is most famous for its fall foliage, is warming the fastest. So we can't just see fall as fast fashion sweaters and PSLs and disconnect ourselves from the ecosystem that human life depends on. And the questions I'm left with are, how did we get here? Is it mostly because of marketing? How far does that go? Can we be marketed, manipulated, tricked into consuming ourselves to a state of the world that we cannot come back from? And I think that to me is the scariest part of spooky season. I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned something new. If you know someone who loves fall, maybe send this to them. And remember until next time, you cannot do all the good that the world needs, but the world needs all the good that you can do. Bye guys. Hi, this is my nephew, Jasper. Do you wanna help me say the out this little thing? I also got this comment on Instagram when I asked for your feedback on if you feel like fall has become all about consumerism. And this just kind of embodies all of my thinking. So I wanted to leave you with this. Okay, love you, bye.